Lord Christ. You may be seated. After Jesus' baptism, as he's coming up out of the water, a voice thunders from heaven. This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Now, all of us long to hear words like that, don't we? If not from God himself, then from our mom and our dad. And if we never hear that from a parent, we long to hear it from someone else that we respect. You are my grandchild. You are my student. You're my employee. You're my friend whom I love. And with you, I am well pleased. And that's, those are words we ache to hear. And yet, sadly, too often, this is what we get. You should have done better. That's all you got? That won't work. What were you thinking? I can't believe you did that, said that, or that. What, did you take a stupid pill? You're no good. That's no good. You're an idiot, moron, worthless, ugly, incompetent, stupid, loser. And the results are devastating. Men will kill themselves to please their dad, coach, commander, employer, or anyone else they respect. And women will go looking for love in all the wrong places and with all the wrong people to find the affection and affirmation her dad never gave her. And not only do we hear that kind of stuff, we say it. We say it to other people, especially to people that we love the most. And, and why, why would we do that? Why are we so quick to see what's wrong with someone instead of what's right with them? And why are we so good about hearing criticism instead of praise? Well, we learn it from our parents. Who learned it from their parents? Who learned it from their parents? And it's so ingrained in our culture that people say those things without even knowing what they're doing. And we hear it so often, it's hard not to believe that it just might be true. Maybe I am an idiot, a moron, worthless, ugly, incompetent, a loser. But that is not how God sees us. And it's not how He wants us to see each other or to see ourselves. Jesus came to change that, to counter our culture of criticism. And in the Bible lessons today, God the Father and God the Son model for us how it's supposed to work. Isaiah reports how the Lord God, the Father, says to His Son, the Messiah, here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. Jesus learned how to speak kindly and gently from His Father, the same way we learn to criticize and berate each other from our parents. Because His Father told Him, you are my Son whom I love and with you I am well pleased, Jesus is able to speak to us the same way. You see, hurting people hurt people. People who have been hurt or who are hurting from what's been done to them slosh their hurts all over everybody around them. On the other hand, people who have been loved and treated kindly and gently are able to love others and treat them kindly and gently as well. Jesus knew His Father loved and delighted in Him, which enabled Him to love and delight in us. The Father continues, I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. Now, Jesus was not all affirming all the time. He knew the difference between justice and injustice. He recognized sin and selfishness, and he called it out when he saw it. But he never insulted or berated or belittled anyone inaccurately or inappropriately. When he called somebody a hypocrite or a snake, it wasn't just criticism, unjust criticism. It was the truth because that's how they were acting. But with most folks, most of the time, especially with the downtrodden, Jesus was a soft place in a hard world. Isaiah continues, He will not shout or cry out or raise His voice in the streets. Jesus was respectful. 
He didn't yell at folks or embarrass them, embarrass them unnecessarily. And I love this next part. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. Now, we've all been bruised by what somebody said or did to us. And we've all had our fire quenched or smothered by criticism or crisis. And where we are bruised, Jesus is especially tender and gentle. And where our life, where our fire is almost out, He's respectful and especially nourishing and encouraging. Jesus, the Son, is that way with us because that's what He learned from His dad, who at His baptism said, This is my Son, whom I love. With Him I am well pleased. And that's how God is with us. And that's how he wants us to be with each other, both in his family and with our neighbors who are not yet in his family. So why don't we do that? Why won't we tell each other how much God and we love each other? Why don't we tell folks Jesus offers to be a soft place in a hard world? Because we're always waiting for someone else to go first. You know, I'll tell you I love you when you tell me you love me. I'll forgive him when he apologizes. I'll be kind to her when she's kind to me. Oh, I'm ready and willing to be Jesus to them when they're that way to me. And sometimes we have good reasons to want the other person to go first. He's the parent. She's the teacher. He's the coach. She's the employer. He started it. She hurt me first. He's my husband and he's supposed to take care of me. She's my wife and she's supposed to respect me. And because we're all waiting for somebody else to go first, God went first. Over and over in the Bible, God shouts to humanity, I love you and I want you in my family. When we were far away from God, He came to us as Jesus. And while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. God already went first. And as soon as we say yes to his invitation to be in his family, he says to us what he said to Jesus at his baptism. You are my beloved child, and with you I am well pleased. God went first. And now as his beloved children, with whom he is well pleased, it's our turn to please him even more by treating others the way he treats us. And since God went first, let's go first with others. You say, but I'm the kid. I'm the student. I'm the wife. I'm not the one who's supposed to go first. So what? Why not? Let's go first anyway. Somebody has to. Why not me? Why not you? For the first 24 years of my life, I never remember my dad ever saying to me, I love you. Now, I gave him a pass because that's not what his generation did, and he probably never heard those words from his father. But deep inside, I would like to hear that. And when I graduated from college, I went to work as a youth minister at an Episcopal church in Nashville, Tennessee, but I didn't have a place to live yet, so I was camping out at my dad's while I was looking for an apartment. Well, after two months of diligently searching, I couldn't find a place. And Nashville's a big city. They've got apartments, but I couldn't find any place that was available. And, I, and I'm praying, and I'm puzzled because nothing's available. And in my prayer time one morning, I get the impression that God is not going to lead me to my next home until I tell my dad, I love you. And I think, what? That's just silly. Dad knows I love him. I know I love him. I know he loves me. We don't have to say anything. But I keep running into dead ends for places to live, and that impression just won't go away, that God is not going to let me move out until I tell my dad I love you. So I think, well, that, that shouldn't be too hard. We eat breakfast together every morning, and nobody else is there, so nobody else will hear me say it. So I start looking for a cool way to tell him I love you. <laughs> there is no cool way to tell somebody I love you. 
So after a week of futilely hoping that the topic might just kind of come up, one morning I blurt out, Dad, I got something to tell you. And he looks at me like, "Uh uh-oh. I said, Dad, I love you. And he looked like I slapped him. (laughs) And he stood up. So I stood up, and he grabbed me by the shoulders, and he pulled me into a hug. For the first time since I was about three years old, my dad hugged me. And he said, I love you too. And ever since that morning, for the next 40 plus years, until he died this time last year, my dad and I never saw each other without hugging and never ended a conversation without saying, I love you. All we needed was for somebody to go first. Why not me? Why not you? Why not look for opportunities to go first in affirming and encouraging people, to tell them what's right with them as enthusiastically as as we tell them what's wrong with them? Because when we do, they may snicker, they may snort, they may sneer at us, but then maybe, just maybe, they'll believe us. And our words of encouragement and affirmation will give them permission to do the same thing with someone else and will help them become who God says they are, His beloved child with whom He loves and with whom He is well pleased. I am the man and the leader that I am today because I had a scoutmaster and a pastor who believed in me before I believed in myself, who saw in me things I didn't see in myself, who said to me things that no one else ever had before. I want you to lead this group because I know you can do it. I want you to teach this lesson because I I know you know your stuff and I have confidence in you. They let me know that I was someone they loved and with whom they were well pleased. And because of their encouragement and affirmation, I became who they said I was. Each of us is in the process of becoming who God says we are, His beloved child with whom He is well pleased. And what God says to us, He wants us to say to others. Now, probably nobody you know will ever hear a word of affirmation or love or encouragement directly from the voice of God like Jesus did at His baptism. But everyone you know can hear a word like that from you. And I'm going to help you do that. In the bulletin today and on the screen, there is a sentence with two blanks in it. You are my blank, whom I blank, and with you I am well pleased. Now under the first blank, there's a list of people in your life that I encourage you to encourage. You are my wife, my husband, you are my son, my daughter, you are my father, my mother, you're my friend, my coworker, my colleague, my employee, my employer, my neighbor, my student, my teacher, my coach. You are my friend whom I blank. And under that blank is a list of verbs to use to bless those folks. Now, if love is too mushy for you or if it's inappropriate in your relationship, pick one of those other verbs and say, you are my friend whom I treasure. You're my coworker, my colleague whom I admire. You're my employee whom I appreciate, my employer whom I respect, my neighbor whom I'm grateful for, my student whom I value. You're my teacher, my coach, who I want to be like, and with you I am well pleased. I encourage you to encourage someone you love, appreciate, admire, or respect this week because each of us can change the world for that person by what we say, for better or for worse. God said to Jesus at his baptism, and he says to each of us today, words we long to hear, you are my beloved child, and with you I am well pleased. And if no one has ever said that to you before, God, the church, and I say it to you now. You are my son, my daughter, my friend, whom I love, and 
with you I am well pleased. And now, what God says to us, let's say to others. And let's go first.